right, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Diana Martinez. I'm the artistic director of Film Streams. Uh, so once again, let's welcome filmmaker Rex Miller. This is why I wear the hat, so now I can see you. <laughs> All right, uh, so how this is gonna go, uh, we're gonna chat for about 20 minutes and then I'm gonna leave like the last 10, 15 minutes or so for Q and A. Um, I'm gonna be asking more general questions about Rex's career and what's it like to be a director and then y'all can ask the specific uh, kind of film questions since you just saw it. So I want to begin with, um, you know, Deirdre told us a long list of work throughout your career. I'm old. <laughs> what, is, um, what is your origin story? So much of, of um, Citizen Ash, right, is, is um, the life's work, really, of Arthur Ashe, both on and off the tennis court. So what's your origin story? What life events led you to becoming a director? It's funny, the first thing I think of when you say that is me in high school in Queens, New York, and I have to walk to the subway and then take the subway into Manhattan. I lived in Queens, and I used to stop on the way home at this, like, we call it a bodega, but like, new, and back in the day, a combination newsstand, magazine store, and I used to go in there and they had a huge wall full of at least 150 different magazines and every month every magazine would change so I used to go there and look at dozens and dozens of magazines and I was just really into the visuals at first so I, as a result of that I became a photojournalist magazine photographer and then on the tennis side that's on the visual storytelling side on the tennis side I am the offspring of two tennis fanatics so like, I was the kid in the crib sitting next to the court while my parents were <laughs> hitting tennis balls, um, ig ignoring me. And uh, so I, I had to play tennis. I had no choice. <laughs> In so, order for them to pay attention to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, literally. Um, or no, not they wouldn't pay attention to me. They would at least let me come. <laughs> OK. Yeah, those are two different things. But anyway, so those are some things like I always played tennis and even when I hated it at various ages, you don't want to do what your parents do, but then you're good at it. So you kind of keep doing it. Um, so I always had this tennis thing and film photojournalism thing going. Mm -hmm. And so when you decided that you wanted to move from photojournalism into being a filmmaker, making your own films, not just as a cinematographer, what did you think that experience was going to be like? And was it anything like you imagined being a director would be? My journey was so long and circuitous. Um, I mean, I, I did photojournalism for like 12 years in New York City, and that's like seven days a week, 24-7. It feels like just trying to survive, um, only doing that. And then I actually stopped doing the photojournalism because I just was burnt out. I finished this book, and it just about killed me. And I was just like, done, I can't go back to just going around the city showing my portfolio and like nothing changed, you mm. know, it was hard. So the film thing happened, like I got an opportunity to, I was playing a little more tennis at that point and this guy asked me, who ran a tennis club, asked me if I wanted a coach at his club. And I was like, no, I don't, I'm not a tennis pro, dude, I'm a photographer. And he's like, I'll pay you $60 an hour and you can, and this is like 25 years ago. Um, and no, not that long, 20 years ago. And, and you can work as much or as little as you want. So I started coaching tennis about 30 hours a week and trying to make films. Hmm. And I did that in New York for five years, coaching tennis, making films, and then leaving New York. And when I left New York, things got easier actually. Mm -hmm. yeah. But to answer your yeah, question yeah. about was it easy, I, I honestly didn't have any expectation because I didn't know any filmmakers to go see what a glamorous life they had mm. or, or didn't have. And I didn't know anybody who was making a living at it, what that was like. And I just, Mike. oh, sorry, I just every day would literally <laughs> look in the mirror and say like, I am a filmmaker, you know, and <laughs> nobody cared. Um, and it's, you know, would I do it again? Yeah, probably I'd do it again. I mean, it, it, it's not very easy to make films, 
But I think if you're doing something that you like to do, that makes it a lot easier. You're kind of good at it. Yeah. Well, you get good at it because <laughs> you, you pick something you like to do and you just work your butt off. And eventually you're at least going to be good at it, mm-hmm. you know, but always keep the side hustle going. Like I still coach tennis a little bit, you know, so have that very grounded thing mm-hmm. to make some money, you know. See, it's funny that you mention like the possibility that there's a glamorous lifestyle lifestyle to being a director. Cause I, think, I mentioned that. Yeah. Yeah. You just did like that. There. Oh, sorry. <laughs> strike that from the record. I don't find that there might be, I don't find anything <laughs> glamorous about what I get. I mean, well, that's, like getting flown out to Omaha <laughs> and taken out and, and wind and a dine, tornado. <laughs> a tornado was <laughs> no charge. Just for right? you. Um, no, there, there are some, the benefits to being a filmmaker is when you finish a film. And there's a lot of times where you might finish a film, but then nobody sees it. And then that's a whole other thing. How do you get people to see your film? Mm -hmm. But I think you get a lot of satisfaction from finishing a film because it's a very difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. And I always encourage people, like if somebody, like any of y'all that want to work with me, I'm really easy to find. And the first thing I always say is, okay, you've got two weeks, go make a one minute film and don't give me any excuses, and then I'll keep talking with you. And most people don't, they don't go do it, but some of them do, and some really cool little one minute films I've gotten about like meeting with students, so. That's cool. Um, I think there's this, uh, I think there's maybe more knowledge about what it takes to be a director of narrative features, so of like fictional films, because there's a lot of behind the scenes footage. You know, we get a lot of interviews, there's a lot of high profile narrative feature directors. Um, but how do you direct a documentary? Because the set, you might not have any control over, right? It might be someone's home. You don't have a traditional script, and you don't always know where the story or the interview is gonna take you. So how do do you do this without, without knowing where you're going from the start? That's a great question. I, I, they say that in documentary, you never make the film you set out to make. And you, the, if you know that going in, you won't stress it. But if you start stressing because the story is going this way, then you shouldn't do documentary because the story changes based on what you go out and gather. And I think with documentary, if you're interested in a subject, you you get sucked into the research on it. Like, that's what I love to do, the research. You just, you know, Arthur Ashe, when this came up, I already knew a lot about him. But the previous film I did was about Althea Gibson. Who knows who Althea Gibson is? Okay, y'all Google it who don't know, okay? Um, that started with Googling Althea. I, had, I didn't know too much about her. But, um, so you get into the research and then you start to get know your story. Let's, if it's historical, that's different than uh, uh, covering like, somebody's life going forward. This is a historical film. So a lot of the work is the research and then identifying who you want to talk about your subject. And one avenue of that is like, who's famous that could talk about Arthur Ashe, okay? But then you wanna also find people that know him, that knew him better than anybody else, even if they're not famous, you know? And then you may wanna do man on the street interviews, which I wanted to do for this, but didn't get around to it. Um, and then in terms of the set in this film, we had two, two kinds of sets. The interview sets where I would go around the country and interview people in their home or at a local hotel or, or a tennis club. Um, and then we did some recreation scenes. And that was by far the most fun for me, like recreating this old tennis footage with the proper old tennis gear from the 40s and 50s and 60s. So that type of set I had control over. And that those were, even though there were actors involved, they tended to be very small sets, so very manageable. And sometimes we'd just shoot for an hour or two, and that was the whole thing. So that's similar in some ways with narrative filmmaking, but it was a very small scale, the recreation stuff. Can you tell us a little bit about the research and the archives? like? You worked on this project for five years. What were some of the kind of like major um, kind of research flashpoints that you came across while you were making the film? 
So I, I'd say there are like two big ones, and the the, one, the first one is what kind of started the the film, and it was when I got a phone call from like after my Althea film came out like five, six years ago, I got a call from this woman and she said, uh, I, hi, I'm Linda Zimmerman. My father was John Zimmerman. He was a Life magazine photographer and Sports Illustrated. And uh, my father photographed Arthur in 1968 for a week during the US Open. And we have 41 rolls of film that nobody's ever seen. And you should do a film about this. Um, this, you know, she, she, she left it to my imagination. What she wanted her dad to be a little more of the story. Um, but, uh, she, I first said, no, I just finished a film about an African American tennis player who, uh, had overcame obstacles and had civil rights linkages. And I think I need a break from that. And then she sent me the 41 contact sheets. Who knows what a contact sheet is? Okay. So, Back in the day when they had this thing called film, does everybody know what film is? Yeah. Um, it, a, a roll of film has like 36 shots on it, and when you print all of them really small on one sheet, it's called a contact sheet. So she sent me the 41 contact sheets, and I got really interested in it because I'm a photographer, and I knew her dad's name from reading Sports Illustrated for years. And so that was sort of the entry point into the project. And those, there's hundreds of photos from his work in the film throughout. And then the second one was I spent a couple weeks at the Schomburg Center in Harlem, which is a museum and an archive for African American um, research. And Arthur's archive is there, his personal archive. And there's like 47 boxes there. I spent a couple weeks going through every single box. And in one of those boxes was a, um, a transcript of, it was probably close to 1,000 pages. And it was Arthur talking, talking, talking. It was just all transcribed. And it turned out that it was the extended interviews that this one writer did with Arthur for his biography that came out right before he passed away called Days of Grace. It's like the definitive book of Arthur Ashe. So this was the interview that this author had done, but it had never been published or heard or seen because it, the book you know, was quotes of Arthur's. But anyway, we reached out to the author, Arnold, Arnold Rampersad, and he's at Stanford still. And he's like, I said, do you maybe have these tapes uh, to go with these transcripts? And he said, I have no idea, but uh, maybe I'll, I'll go take a look in the attic. You know? <laughs> and he actually called us back a few days later, and he found this shoebox with 33 micro cassettes in it. And he said, do, would you like to you know, hear, hear them? <laughs> yeah. So that was the best thing that ever happened. And it changed this film to where it's, a lot of it is told in Arthur's voice. You know, and and it was fascinating to have read a lot of this stuff and then to hear it, you know, and then um, most of it was pretty good quality. Some was mm -hmm. better than other, mm -hmm. but those were the two big archival. Th oh, sorry. The last one was Jeannie uh, Mutus Muta Matusame Ash is Arthur's wife. And she gave us a bunch of stuff that she still had, including Arthur's home movies of going to Vietnam and all around Southeast Asia. So Arthur mm -hmm. filmed that and then would hand the camera to his buddies and they would take turns filming. So that was my favorite footage, Arthur playing tennis in Vietnam at an air base mm -hmm. with hel helicopters going overhead. Mm -hmm. So you have all this stuff, hours worth of stuff. Hours. Film, an hour and 35, a tight an hour 35 minutes. How do you begin to narrow it down? Like, what is the process? What is the team behind combing through all the stuff and finding the stuff that's usable and that's impactful? Yeah, it can go really slowly. And there, you can't rush it. It just takes time. It takes time. Um, you know, and if there's other obstacles involved, like you change editors, like every editor, and this happens several times on this film, every editor wants to watch every single, single thing and they start from scratch, and they don't want to be rushed. And it's like three, four months before you can even talk to them. And then they don't get it yet, because they've just watched it once. And then their first cut is like horrendous, because I've already seen this scene edited by five people, you know, <laughs> and you're starting from scratch. Um, anyway, it takes time. And then, so 
Also, we got to talk about my co-director, Sam Pollard, who, if you Google him, he's like the man. Um, he came on relatively late in the, in the process. He worked on it for like the last year and some, and that's what he's great at. You know, he is an editor, master status, and I know how to edit, but I'm not an editor, nor do I claim to be. Like, I love working with great editors. You kind of like talk to them and then you give it to them and then they come back with magic, you know. Arthur is difficult as a character because he's not like, and this relates to his activism, you know, he's not a rock thrower, he's not a Muhammad Ali, Stokely Carmichael, he's real even tone, he's not very emotive, so how do you make that interesting? And that was the challenge throughout the whole process of making this film was how do we get like, Arthur to be dramatic or people to care about him and you know yeah. it took a long time yeah it takes a long time and Sam will talk about it and I've learned a lot just talking about this film because I get to listen to him also talking about the film mm -hmm. and he said one thing that really stuck with me and he, and w we were at answering the same question how do you winnow it down and you have to be real careful that you're not just putting somebody's resume out there on a film. Yeah. And, and there were so many, the biggest, the, the hardest thing from the get-go was act three. Um, like the, his, the crescendo of the film is kind of like after he wins Wimbledon, basically. And then it's just, but still there's another 20 years of his life and he did all these amazing things. And the, the danger was like a list. And then he did this, and then he did that. And there were things that I fought for that didn't get in. But as Sam explains it, you know, you can't get too concerned with putting all the information in. You want to leave an audience with emotional resonance, mm -hmm. something that resonates with people on some sort of level. Uh, that's what you're trying for. I have one more question before we open it up to the audience. Um, And it's kind of, I don't know, you can get as self-helpy here as you want. So you worked on the project for five years. How did you sustain your enthusiasm for the work over such an extended period of time? Like, how do you stay like in love with the subject? I think that's my proudest achievement, actually, is that I stuck with it. Because there were some times where I was like... I was so down on this project. But for me, at the, from the very beginning, it was all about Arthur. Like, what's good for Arthur? Because I was entrusted with this project from his wife and his brother, Johnny, who were behind me the whole time. There were just a lot of obstacles. Like, that's documentary filmmaking. It's not like somebody knocks on your door, here's a million dollars, go make a film about Arthur Ashe, we'll see you in a couple of years. No, there's like com committees of people chiming in, and this one, the editor quits, and then this money's gone, and blah, 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 blah. There's a lot of obstacles besides the creative so f and there were there were fights and whatnot not with the finishing team when we finished we were like in unison and like l you know everybody was r loving everybody else um <clears throat> but for me I could flip a switch when something obstacle would come in I would just go what's good for Arthur you know and, and that was my way of just okay this is what I have to do that's how I did it Great, so we have um, a few minutes for questions. Maybe we'll start with three. So Lisa and Patrick will be on both sides of the theater. If you have a question, please raise your hand really high and wait for them to get a mic to you. And please speak into the mic and that's the only way that we can hear you. So if you have a question, raise your hand really high. I just wanna thank everybody here for coming out. Like, really appreciate it. Yeah, Patrick and at the top. Thanks to Deidre and the whole team here. Appreciate it. Hi, I'm Josh with the Boys and Girls Club. Um, I don't have a question per se, but I just wanted to really thank everybody that made this possible. Um, it's a very exclusive event, and we really want to thank you for thinking of the Boys and Girls Club to be here, um, to appreciate that. So just thank you for everybody that made this possible tonight. And thank you. Yeah, thanks again for coming out. While we're getting yeah, the next Yeah, Lisa has someone with a question. Go ahead. I, I just want to say, like, when I make a film like this, this is the audience that I'm hoping will come and see it. So, 
you go and tell all your friends who Arthur Ashe was. So what happened to the daughter? Why was she not in the movie? To the daughter. What the question was, what happened to the daughter? Her name's Camera. That's a good question. Um, I've never met Camera. Uh, Camera does not have a public life as the daughter of Arthur Ashe. And that's it. Did you reach out the, to her? Uh, well, I was in touch with Jeannie a lot, but that was off the table from the beginning. Hmm. Interesting. That, that's, that's just how that family operates. Yeah. I think she's in her early 30s. I think we have another question here. How much money did it cost to make the film? So I think our... F I, I think the budget is announced at like 1.5 million or something like that. I could be wrong, something like that. I dis I distanced myself by the end of where the money was going and who was writing the checks. I was in charge of it for a few years, and then I was like, "All right, y'all handle it." And you don't and you don't need that much to make a documentary. It's just what happens when a whole lot of people get involved in it. <laughs> we have one question over there. Are you hiring? Are you hiring? Hmm. <laughs> hey, all, you know, I hire freelance people all the time, so I love to get resumes, you know? <laughs> you heard him. Make, make a two-minute film. I'm not hard to find. I'm not hard to find. My, my website is rexpix, R-E-X-P-I-X. -E I'm really easy to find, so it's totally fine. I'll write people back if you have a question or what. Um, I think we have a question towards the top. What kind of setbacks were there? You don't have enough time this evening. <laughs> um, the setbacks were more on the business and producer side. Of The setbacks were, at certain points, people that I thought were going to help me make my film were trying to make this other film and kind of wrestling for control of the story. And I think... I've talked about this, about, I talk about this with Sam. We talk about, you know, we're asked how is it working together and making a film together. And at the end of the day, I like 90% of this film. And mostly the other 10% is things that were left out. But I get it because, yeah, it's all stuff that was left out. But you have to make it tight, you know. I hope there'll be a director's cut someday. But there's really cool tennis footage that I found of Arthur like before he was famous that I thought was and we had some really interesting uh, recreation stuff we actually gave this little kid who, who's in the film he's the little kid hitting against the fence and walking we gave him and he's a pretty good player and now two three years later he's a really good little player he's like trying to be Arthur Ashe but we gave him a real tennis lesson in the vintage gear like because he has he didn't have a a, a one-handed backhand so we taught him and the pro was miked and the pro was in vintage gear and teaching him so I thought it was really cool anyway th those are the sacrifices that you have to make but um, the setbacks, those were the harder setbacks, was the business side of stuff, other people. So the more people you get on board your project, the more voices you have to listen to. So even though it's lonely sometimes, do whatever you can on your own. Mm. Like engage with people, but have it, if you're going to make a film, take ownership of it and go make your film. Don't let other people kind of steer you this way or steer you that way. They can help. They can hold the mic or hold the lights or l rent you the camera, but make your film. That's what I was trying to do here. And whenever I, so to me, when I was saying I like 90% of it, I'm kind of like still a little ticked off about the other 10. But every single other filmmaker I talked to was like, 90%, that's great, bro. That's really good. So it just depends on where you're sitting. Can I ask a follow-up to that? Because I think that was a good question, and it led into an interesting part. Because this film is so much about um, a young man growing up and finding his voice, right? And, and as someone whose job depends on their voice and having a point of view and having something to say as a filmmaker, what would be your best advice for a young person who's trying to find their own voice? Like through filmmaking? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, start making a film. 
Like, don't wait till you have the money. Don't wait till you have the camera. Don't wait till whatever, you know, just go start making a film. Because nobody's going to, like, just say, hey, here's a big check. Let's go make your film. Like, mm -hmm. go make films. And then when you're done, hopefully people will see it. But then go make another one. And then go make another one. So, yeah, one-minute film, five-minute film. Then you have something to show. Mm -hmm. Next thing you know, when you have something, hey, my film's playing at the Down the Block Film Festival. Oh, wow, hey, he's real, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and other people, all of a sudden, a year later, don't have that, and you've had a film in a, in a film festival. And then next thing you know, somebody hires you, maybe even in this room, hires you to shoot their daughter's wedding because you're such a good filmmaker, and you make some money to go fund your next film. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's all about being active and don't wait around, borrow a camera, you have a phone, you have a camera, go make a film. Mm -hmm. Great. Do we have any other questions? Yeah, Louisa has a question. Has someone with a question up top. Uh, do you think this topic's, topic is important and would you write, an, not write, direct another movie about it? And when you say topic, clarify that for me. Like the, like, oh, sorry. <laughs> like the, uh, like being set back because of your race and stuff like that in certain sports, would you write another movie about that or direct it? You know what I meant. Oh, you, n you never know. Is it a trilogy? Is oh, yeah, question. I did. Althea and Arthur. Well, yeah, there was going to be a, a, another smaller one with somebody. There, Lenny Simpson, who's in this film, deserves a, f a, a film. Um, yeah, I'm op I like good stories. Um, so... I'm open to anything that's like a good story and that I may have an interest in. So sports, I've been playing sports since I could walk. And uh, I've been involved with a lot of stories that have to do with uh, social justice issues and racial stories. So yeah, yes or no, yes, I'd make another film about athletes overcoming obstacles in all kinds of ways. And I think obstacles can be different obstacles. Art, one of Arthur's one was racism in the Deep South and institutional racism. But there's other obstacles as well. And so like at the moment, I'm making a film about a, uh, a punk rock skinhead guy who was very violent. <laughs> um, but I found this humanity in him. And his origin story just became really interesting to me. And I'm working on another one about a jazz, you know, figure from 50 years ago. So, yeah, all kinds of stories. I love finding interesting stories, you know. Maybe one of you has a next story for me. Um, we need to wrap up for time, but kind of as a final question, going off of um, the last question that was just asked, you know, again, five years span during the making of this film and a lot changed politically during that time, right? There was like the renewed spirit of black activism after the murder of George Floyd. How did that shape how you were thinking about this film? Because it's happening while you're yeah. making it, right? So what, what does it mean? Um, how did it shape the film then? And then what does it mean to have the film out now? Yeah, I've been asked, Sam and I have been asked a lot about like, oh, this film is so timely. And in my opinion, Arthur's, I think whenever this film came out, it would have been timely. I mean, if it came out a year and a half ago, it probably would have been even more timely. So how did the events shape the film when, so Arthur's from Richmond, right? The capital of the Confederacy, and that's where a bunch of the uh, Confederate general statues were torn down. So I was up there several times filming uh, on that boulevard, and I wanted that story to be in it. You know, what's happening in Richmond this moment? You know, the, the amount of graffiti on General Robert E. Lee was staggering. <laughs> it was beautiful, too. Um, so, yeah, we were very aware of what was happening around the country, but then also what was happening in Richmond. Arthur, and Arthur has a statue on the same boulevard, okay? And the boulevard with all the uh, generals, the Confederate generals, is now been renamed Arthur Ashe Boulevard. So Arthur wasn't even allowed to like walk around there. Like it wasn't written in the laws. But if you were a black kid back in the 40s and you were walking in that part of town, you know, you would have, you could have had trouble. You could have had an Emmett Till situation. Um, so yeah, it was it was always very close. When I say it, the pro the production 
uh, and my interest in particular living in the South, I live in Durham, North Carolina. It's just like two hours down the road from Richmond. So, and I was in touch with uh, a couple of journalist, journalist colleagues in Richmond about what was going on. But again, it comes down to 90 minutes, you know, and you can't put everything in. So DVD extras. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for the story that did end up here because it's just as important and just as timely and just as impactful. And thank you so much for being here with us in person and speaking to us today. Please give Rex Miller another round of applause.